Hi, my name is Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the A-Liner Titanium today. Uh, right up front here on the tongue, we do have your uh, tongue jack. Uh, this camper is very kind of utility trailer-esque in design, uh, up here in the tongue anyway. Uh, you have an easy manual up or down operation with that tongue jack. Uh, now that wheel uh, makes the unit very maneuverable uh, when it is stationary. Uh, when it is loaded on your vehicle, however, that wheel does need to come off and be stored. So it is only to be used when the unit is stationary. Coming up here to the uh, battery box, that is a Group 24 Interstate Deep Cycle Battery. Uh, there is some maintenance that goes along with that. Uh, what that means for you is two or three times a year, we're going to pull these vent panels up here. There will be a clear, wa clear marked water level. Uh, we will want to maintain that water, water level using distilled water. Two 20-pound propane tanks behind that. Uh, they are full. Uh, open and close valve on the top. I find most people are somewhat familiar with the standard 20-pound propane tanks. In between the two, you do have an automatic switchover regulator. Uh, what that means for you is that as long as this valve is open, uh, or the tank you're wishing to draw off of as long as that valve is open uh, and this is directionalized towards that tank, you are going to be drawing off of that tank. Now, if you have both of these valves open and you use the entirety of this tank, it is going to automatically switch over to this tank here. And now when it comes to removing the tanks and refilling them, uh, you are going to do that uh, by first disconnecting the, the pigtail here, loosening this oversized wing nut, uh, rotating this T-bar out of the way. You may even have to remove this regulator and kind of flop it over. But from there, you should be able to remove those tanks, uh, take them to, to be maintained or filled. Uh, we do have stabilizer jacks on all four corners of the unit. Uh, just a reminder, these are for stabilization. They are not for leveling. Uh, leveling from front to back will be done with the main tongue jack. Leveling from left to right will be the, done with the tires and what's called a leveling kit. Uh, when it, once you are fairly certain of your level, you are going to go ahead and then run these down. Uh, three quarter inch drive nut here on the front. Uh, you'll use an included crank handle uh, to crank those up or down. Uh, now it is important to kind of use a light touch with these. Uh, they will stay in better shape longer if you do so. Uh, so on the way down, you come down, you make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to shore up the floor. Same on the way up. Again, I want to make a habit of kind of muscling those into position. As we travel here around the outside of the camper, uh, first thing we come to is a ZAMP style solar plug here. Uh, that is a direct connection to the battery and used uh, in conjunction with any portable solar panel system, uh, briefcase folding panel, uh, any of those portable options uh, will generally have the charge controller built directly into the panel. Uh, what that means for you is you do just essentially need to plug and play into this port and that charge controller is going to maintain the battery as necessary. Um, coming down here, we have the outside shower. Uh, Doug does give you access to hot and cold water uh, on the valves. Uh, does have a on off switch on the fixture itself uh, that will allow you to uh, conserve water, uh, hot water and, and water resources as necessary. Uh, shower head does wrap around the fixture there. Everything does store in this compartment um, easily. Outside or your refrigerator here uh, generally, this compartment, uh, these are going to be covered with these vents here. Uh, it is very important to go one step further and screen these openings off uh, from mud daubers, flying insects. They are attracted to the smell of propane, so they will, if they can get in, make their nest directly there into the burn tube. So you have vents top and bottom, uh, and it is very important to screen those off. Uh, now when we look here uh, into the compartment, all of your controls are going to be done here on the back side of the unit. Uh, if you look at this box here and you make a line right down the center, 
Uh, everything utilized here on the right side of that panel is going to be for electricity, whether that's 110 volt electricity or 12 volt. Uh, everything uh, to do with electricity is going to be there on the right side. Uh, everything to do with the propane gas side of things is going to be there on the left side of that panel. Uh, so whether we're going to be using the units on a 110 volt electricity there or 12 volt electricity here, this is going to be our temperature control knob here. Uh, we have one through seven. Uh, of course, the higher the number, the cooler the unit will be. And we want to make sure that we are only utilizing one power source here at a time. Now, if we switch over to the other side, we're going to light this kind of more traditionally like you would a, any you know, pilot light driven appliance. Uh, what that means is we are going to turn this uh, too high and then when we push that down that gives us a flow of propane through the line. Uh, generally you'll find yourself kind of holding this down uh, 30 seconds to a minute before you even start igniting it here with that piezo igniter. Reason being for that is, is this, these appliances run very efficiently on propane. Oftentimes, if the unit has been sitting for any amount of time that propane has bled out from the line. Um, and the line has filled with the air. What we're doing here when we're holding this down for 30 seconds to a minute is we are just expressing that air from the line and getting a fresh pool of propane. Uh, so once you have held this down for 30 seconds to a minute, you can start igniting it here. You're going to want to actuate that piezo igniter uh, as rapidly as you can uh, to give you the, the more likelihood of lighting it. Uh, now you can expect inspect whether or not that uh, you have a flame there in the refrigerator by sliding that window there. Uh, of course, when it is lit, you'll see a nice tight blue flame in there. Uh, outside of your furnace here or your furnace exhaust vent there, uh, it is very important uh, again to, to screen that off uh, from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, other than that, it is an exhaust. Uh, let it breathe, not something you'd want to put a lawn chair in front of or block in any way. Uh, it does blow very hot air when it is on, so it, it will melt whatever you put in front of it. Uh, down low here, we have your drain outlet. Uh, since, they are, there, since there are no holding tanks in the A-liner, uh, it is plumbed through the floor and out the side. Uh, now you can get a reducer to reduce this uh, to a standard garden hose size um, fitting that would allow you to route your wastewater away from your campsite. Brings us to tire pressure and lug nuts. Uh, tire pressure, max tire pressure rating on this unit is 50 PSI. That is stamped on the sidewall of the tire as well as on this data sticker uh, right here on the side of the camper. Uh, very important to maintain that 50 PSI tire pressure. That does give you the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating, whether you are completely full or completely empty, that 50 PSI is a good number to maintain. Uh, also, lug nut torque is very important. It is very important to maintain a 100 foot pound lug nut torque. Uh, they have been torqued down here in our shop. Uh, manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. So that retorque procedure is going to be the first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. They want you to maintain that 100 foot pound torque uh, using a torque wrench. Uh, manufacturer further recommends that every time you move the unit from there on after, you do go ahead and, and check that they are maintaining that 100 foot pound torque. 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here, only plugs into the camper one way. Uh, if we go ahead and disconnect this, you can see that it is only accommodated one way. So once you go ahead and plug that guy in there, give it an eighth inch turn to the right, that locks it in. Then we do have this secondary collar here to screw down and lock it in further. Now this is your cord, comes with the unit. It is 30 feet in length. Uh, if you find yourself wanting to pre-cool your refrigerator, uh, before a trip by plugging the unit into your garage, uh, you can do so by utilizing this 30 to 15 amp reducer. That's going to go on the wall side of the plug and then of course that's going to reduce that down to a standard 15 amp outlet and that is included here with your starter kit. 
talking about the water heater here, uh, again, going to sound a bit redundant, but we do need to protect these uh, intrusion points from mud daubers and flying insects, and we're going to use some screening material to do so. Uh, other than that, uh, it is very important that we follow the manufacturer's recommendations uh, with this unit, uh, not only for maintenance, but um, safety precautions as well. Uh, manufacturer has two very specific recommendations. Number one is going to be anytime the unit is going to be stored for more than seven days, you do need to drain this separate of the rest of the system. And number two is before using it, uh, make sure that you do have six gallons of water in it. Uh, starting with number one, uh, draining the water heater. It is very important that we depressurize the water heater and uh, before we drain it, uh, again, from a, from a safety standpoint. So what I recommend is, of course, give the water heater ample time to cool down, a lot longer than you would think. Generally, I recommend about eight hours. Uh, once you are fairly confident that that water heater has cooled down, you do need to depressurize it. So you can depressurize it at any fixture on the unit. Uh, of, close, of course, you're gonna cut the flow of water into the unit and then go ahead and turn the hot side of the spigot. That's going to blow off any excess pressure. Once that pressure has been relieved, uh, you can come here uh, right to the unit and this is going to be your drain plug here. Uh, so you're going to stick an inch and an eighth socket and extension on that drain plug and go ahead and back that out and the remaining, you know, four to five gallons of water is then going to uh, drain from the unit. It is very important again that we do depressurize the unit either using the hot side of the spigot or the pressure relief valve here. Um, on the flip side of that conversation, manufacturer recommends that you prime the water heater or make sure that there is six gallons of water in the, in the unit uh, before lighting it off. Uh, to do so, of course, you're gonna introduce water to the system. And again, you're just gonna turn that hot side of the spigot on. Uh, that flow at that spigot is going to be initially very airy, flowy, interrupted. Uh, what's happening is it is pumping six gallons of water into the water heater before you physically see it at the fixture. So as that flow normalizes, as it works that air out of the system, uh, once that flow is normal, that would be a very in good indicator that you do have six gallons of water in the unit. You can go ahead and uh, turn it on, fire it off, uh, heat that water up to temperature. Now we talked about your drain plug here. That drain plug kind of pulls double duty. So it's not only a drain plug, it's not only how you're going to drain the unit, but it is also an anode rod as well. So on the other, the backside of that drain plug, you have a three quarter inch by, or three quarter inch by 12 inch piece of magnesium. What that is doing is acting as a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. Uh, now it is a consumable part. Expect to get a year or two before having to change your anode rod and um, you will replace your drain plug and anode rod is one assembly. You'll have to source that from your local RV dealer or supplier. Uh, and that just about covers the water heater here. We're going to come up here to your water sources. Uh, the first one we're gonna come to is going to be your potable water or non-pressurized water. Um, when you are doing any off-grid camping, boondocking, uh, you're going to bring your water with you. So you would stick a garden hose directly in there, fill it up, do it overflows. Uh, once it's full, uh, you're going to need to use that onboard water pump to pressurize the system and draw that up to the fixtures. That's going to be a separate switch and we're going to go over that there on the inside. Uh, right next to that is we do have your city water connection. Uh, water pressure is very important when we talk about the city water connection. Uh, so again, as part of your starter kit, we do include a water pressure regulator. Now this water pressure regulator keeps the water pressure below or in between, I should say, 40 and 50 PSI. Uh, you can go upwards to 75 PSI water pressure with these units uh, if you feel that 40, in between 40 and 50 PSI just does not give you enough pressure. Uh, max out at 75 PSI though. I wouldn't go any higher than that. Uh, no matter the water pressure regulator, it's going to hook directly onto the water source or spigot side of the plumbing. Of course, from there, your 
freshwater drinking hose connects to that. And then we're going to thread this onto the trailer connection uh, again by rotating that trailer bound connection. To drain your freshwater tank here, uh, and you only need to drain it when you have put introduced water into it. Uh, that drain is going to be right here on the side. Uh, you will just unscrew this plug there and that will, it's a gravity feed system. That water is going to go ahead and drain out of there. Uh, nothing too terribly much to speak of here on the backside of the unit. Of course, we have your rear stabilizer jacks. We have a full size spare with matching wheel, uh, tail lights, license plate lights, things like that um, are just kind of existing back here. So not, not much from a maintenance standpoint. Cool cat air conditioner here. Um, when it is running, I expect to see water coming from the unit. That is very normal. Uh, we'll choose the path of least resistance. So it may not always come out of these weep holes here. Uh, that all depends on being level. Uh, step here is going to be a uh, up and in kind of motion. And we also have the door hold back here. Uh, we have that engaged here. That motion is going to be uh, something like that. Uh, and that's just going to keep that door from swinging in the wind there. Uh, we do have your main we do have your main compartment here. Uh, this is of course accessible from the door here, cutting the side of the unit is accessible from the inside as well, uh, keeping you from having to come outside every time you do need to access that compartment. And that just about covers it here on the outside. We are going to hop on the inside and start going over that stuff in there. So here on the inside of the door, we're gonna start here at the front of the camper, uh, work our way to the rear. Uh, on both the front and the rear window, you do have a, a privacy shade, uh, of course, which is a nice feature. Those are just tension held, um, just pull up or down. Uh, lights in the units, uh, switches are going to be right there on the fixture. So easy up or down uh, operation with that. Uh, pedestal, style sta uh, pedestal style dinette, uh, this does make a secondary sleeping area. Uh, the train of thought here is that you are going to disassemble the, excuse me, disassemble the dinette table. Uh, doing so, you generally have to kind of wiggle this um, out of the way. Uh, of course, there is one more uh, disassembly point there. Um, of course, separate the pieces. Uh, from there, you have four slats here on the back wall. Uh, you would take these slats. Uh, from their little keeper there and lay all four of those out evenly here. Uh, once all four are in place, you are going to take these back cushions, use those to fill out the mattress, uh, and then again you have that secondary sleeping area. Uh, when not in use, of course, everything does store right back here on the back side of the unit. and table will easily go back into place. Uh, as I mentioned on the outside, you do have storage underneath each one of these uh, bench seats. Uh, this one is of course accessible from the outside as well. This one is only accessible here from the inside. Um, cooktop here. Uh, so this is your standard suburban cooktop. There is no sparker or igniter. So you will need to keep a long stem barbecue with the lighter or excuse me with the cooktop. Um, you go ahead and turn this to light. Uh, you don't have to hold this in or anything. Once you turn that to light that flow of propane is flowing. Uh, you would take your long stem barbecue lighter put the flame as close to the burner as you can and it will light. Uh, when not in use, you can go ahead and close that up. And it is very important that you do close this before closing the unit itself. Uh, 
we talked about the refrigerator there from the outside uh, you do not have control over it here on the inside so as it sits um, you know a, a small dorm style fridge and again all your controls are going to be there from the outside uh, these switches that we see here are going to be for your water pump and your water heater so up on both of these switches is on down would be off a water pump is going to be on anytime you are drawing that water up from the tank now our water heater is up to temperature for us right now so it's it's not going to do anything when i turn that switch on uh, if this were a if the water heater were full with cold water and we were initially heating it up uh, once i turn that switch on that red light's going to come on with that switch uh, that red light is essentially your indicator on whether or not the water heater has lit. Uh, so with that switch in the on position, this red light, you're going to see that red light is in, until the water heater lights. So if you come back five minutes later and that red light's still on, that means your water heater has not lit. The water heater will try and light or cycle three times uh, before uh, giving up and, and leaving that red light illuminated. So a couple reasons why your water heater may not light. You know, maybe you don't have the maybe you don't have the propane tanks on up front. Maybe maybe you're out of gas up there in your propane, um, or maybe it just hasn't made its way to the appliance yet. Either way, in the event that that happens, uh, go outside, investigate that you do have gas, everything's on, everything's as it should be, uh, and then just turn the switch off, turn it back on. It's going to cycle another three times. If there were any problems initially, then it generally will light the first try of the second cycle. Uh, sink here, um, it's a little hard to see this, but down and out is going to be cold water there. Up and out is going to be hot water. And we do have a little bit of air in the system that's going to be natural. And then when you're going down the road, before you put these walls down, we do want to make sure that's angled down. We don't want to accidentally turn on that uh, fixture when going down the road. Uh, this outlet here is going to be your GFI resettable outlet. All these receptacles you see in the unit are on one circuit. Uh, what that means is there is one central reset point for this particular unit. It is going to be right there. So just like in your bathroom at home, uh, if it gets overloaded, you will need to manually reset it. Uh, we have your designated TV area of the camper or just a 12 volt cigarette lighter style receptacle. They put that there uh, for either a 12 volt TV or really any 12 volt appliance. Um, and it is again, just a, a cigarette lighter style 12 volt receptacle. Thermostat here. Uh, now this is a touch button thermostat. Um, these are not physical buttons. They are responsive to touch. Uh, this is going to be your mode button here on the left. Uh, you do initially have to choose a fan speed. So your first selection is going to be a fan speed. Uh, just like a lot of your residential thermostats, you have a low, high, and auto selection. Now if you go to low or high, that fan on that on that air conditioner is going to run indefinitely even if it reaches that the, the temperature that you've uh, designated here so auto is going to be your best friend it's going to reach that temperature and shut off so we're going to keep it in auto and then that kicks us into the air conditioner mode uh, and it is denoted here by that uh, snowflake and cool so uh, of course, controlling temperature is going to be done with the up or down arrows there. And that is all going to come from the ducts uh, underneath the bed, essentially from the cool cat air conditioner. Now, if we hit it one more time, that's going to take us into the furnace. Uh, now, what A-Liner does here is they give us uh, two different heat options. Uh, one is going to be a propane burning 12 volt ignition option and you're going to find that here that's a 12 volt blower motor 12 volt ignition propane is the source um, now that blower motor kicks on uh, immediately after 
the thermostat recognizes what we're doing 16 seconds after that. It actually ignites that propane gas. Uh, by that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Uh, now, if you were in the capacity of an RV park, there is also a 110 volt electric heat pump style uh, furnace or, or heating method. Uh, so to do that, we're going to go one more selection over on the thermostat till it says heat pump. Uh, and again, once it recognizes what I'm doing, it's going to shut down this propane burning appliance and then it will blow the hot air from the heat pump at the same locations where your air conditioner comes from. And uh, next selection is just going to be off. And then it, it kind of enters that standby mode. Uh, this propane burning furnace, you may be able to hear that it is still on. It just goes through a cool down uh, mode, takes about two minutes to, to blow off that excess heat um, and shut off completely. Now here on this back wall here, we have uh, number one, we have your fuse panel breaker box. Uh, everything there on the right is going to be a 12 volt appliance. Uh, you have your automotive blade style fuses here on the right. Uh, of course, it's our recommendation as a dealership that you pick up a variety pack of fuses, keep them with the unit. Uh, everything on the left side of the unit is going to be your 110 volt light switch style breakers. Uh, those should be very similar to what you have at home. They are resettable. So in the event that one of those gets overloaded, you will be able to manually reset it. Uh, right next to that, we have your carbon monoxide LP leak detector there. Uh, that is a 12 volt appliance. There are no batteries to change, nothing like that. Uh, we'll let you know which gas it is sensing by the uh, series of light flashes on the front of the unit um, and does have a test button on it. Uh, again, it's our recommendation that you go ahead and test your safety equipment every single time you take the unit out. Uh, this is going to be the, the kind of essentially the main sleeping area of the camper. Uh, the way that this makes a bed is very, very simple. Uh, you go ahead and you pull this forward and then you just have these cushions here uh, that you would space out and lay flat. And there you have a bed. So that just about covers the appliances and maintenance here on the inside of the unit. Of course, we have the other pull up blind, things like that. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we are going to uh, turn everything off and we are going to shut the unit down, uh, show you what to expect when it comes to that. So when you're shutting the unit down, uh, it is very important that we undo these rear latches. Now it goes without saying that uh, these walls are supported with two latches on either side. Now if you undo both latches and you're not holding it up, that wall will come down. So keep that in mind, you always have to hold that wall. So we're going to do the two rear ones first. Uh, reason being is because once we, so your driver side wall always comes down first. If we put that driver side wall down first, then you are not going to be able to reach the, reach the rear latch. Um, so we're going to do the two rear ones first, then we're going to come here to the front one. And once, Again, once I undo that latch, that wall is free floating. So we do need to support it. Uh, and also a point that I did not bring up is everything needs to be below the hinge line here. So as we can see, we have this cushion sticking up there above the hinge line. We need to bring that down and we need to bring this one down. So everything needs to be below the hinge line. From there, I set the wall down here. I have already done that rear latch, so I just have to do this latch here. And again, it is very important because these two doors are latched together. You cannot put that wall down with these two doors latched together. So once I unhook that door here, I have to kind of hold this door in a, a kind of a, a semi awkward position to allow it to clear the aluminum framing of that roof panel. So once I clear that, I can come in here and I can lay that down. 
Uh, once I have that door down, if, it's, if you have a friend or somebody helping you, uh, they can go ahead and pop the, pop the, the roof loose. Um, and of course you would separate this, this wind protection. We're going to go over that wind protection here in just a few minutes on, and how to utilize that uh, and when you will use that. So once that wind protection is disengaged, you would then hop back here on the inside. And what I'm going to do is I'm just pushing up on the forward roof panel just enough to release this wall panel from its position. So from there, I need to make sure these doors are shut. So not only does this one need to be shut and flat and sometimes your shade there will get in the way and we just want to make sure that is uh, free. And then we have your door here and we're going to shut the door, uh, make sure everything is good to go. And again, your, your wall is free from there. So from there, you're going to go ahead and start pulling these down. And since I'm a short guy, I like to start here at the rear and I'll kind of work my way up until I can grab this panel here. So then I go ahead and shut that all the way. And once it is shut all the way, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and latch that down there. And to keep in mind, these latches are at their longest point when they are fully open. So once I have that connected there, I can go ahead and push that latch down. And then we're going to come over here to the other side. And do those latches. like that. Uh, and now we're just going to kind of go through that whole process in reverse, uh, except for this time we're going to show you how to utilize the wind protection. Uh, just like the sticker says, these are very susceptible when it does come to erecting them in high winds. Um, what this wind protection does is it gives you a handle, it gives you something uh, very rigid to hold on to, keeping this uh, from potentially taking off on you. What happens is when you're lifting these roof panels up and you kind of get into this halfway position, uh, you are very susceptible from a back wind hitting this front panel and bending it that way. So what we're going to do is again start out just like we finished off with undoing these latches here. We're going to come around here to the other side. Uh, once we've done that, uh, we're going to keep everything as compressed as we can. We're going to come here and we're going to undo this latch. And we're going to, again, in a, in a windy situation, we'd want to keep a nice strong hold on this. We're going to rotate that down as we are, again, helping this up. So once you reach a certain point, Pushing this up does no longer does anything because your angles are off. So what you're going to do is again, keeping a firm hold on this, you're going to help with the other hand until you get into that position there. And from there, you would go ahead and latch this in. Now, this whole process goes slightly easier with someone to help because we have this side of the roof locked in, but the other side is not. So. In theory, there'd be another person here doing the very same thing I did on the other side. Once we have that in locked into position, we can go ahead, rotate this high wind kit over. And then we're going to pin it. So what we're doing there is when this is engaged here, we are essentially linking the two roof panels together. So again, it makes everything more stable and gives you a nice handle to hold onto in the event that you are putting it up in high winds. 
That basically covers the A-liner titanium. If you do have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, we can generally walk you through most of these appliances on the phone. Uh, we hope this helped uh, clarify some things for you. Thank you.